Thanks so much for coming to our opening event for the exhibition Survival in Sarajevo. And uh, the exhibit Survival in Sarajevo is on display in the Skylight Gallery, which is on the sixth floor uh, from now until March 16th. So I hope you all get a chance to see it. It's, it's a really, really wonderful story. And so anyways, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Ed Serrata. He is a journalist, a photographer, a filmmaker, and Ed founded Centropa in 2000. So please help me welcome Ed Serrata. I'd like to thank you all uh, very much for coming tonight. And uh, I will be something of the master. I'll play Ed Sullivan, introducing uh, uh, our, our guest. Uh, and uh, what we'll do is as uh, follows. Uh, we'll hear from uh, a couple of people who I've asked to say a few words. And then I'll speak about this uh, project a little more. We'll watch a, a short film that is now being used in more than 250 schools in a dozen countries. Uh, it is narrated in English by me, except in, in England where we have a Downton Abbey type uh, uh, narrator because they don't like my accent there. Uh, and then we also have, it's also in German and in Spanish and in Hebrew. Uh, and it ha we have versions with uh, Albanian subtitles and Arabic subtitles. Um, uh, uh, and I know that because the time is short, uh, I'll, I'll introduce someone to say a few words at the beginning. Uh, and that is um, Al Noor is the Deputy Consul General here in uh, uh, San Francisco. And we met in uh, an auditorium like this in Belgrade uh, two years ago. Uh, when my institute created a multimedia film about two sisters, uh, two Serbian girls, uh, Jewish girls, who were saved during the Holocaust by a Catholic priest. Uh, and that film, we launched it in Belgrade, uh, and that film is now being used in more than 100 schools throughout Serbia. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I'll be in Serbia in two weeks uh, to conduct a seminar uh, about it. The Sephardic history of the Balkans is, is, is long and it is extremely complex, uh, as you all know. Uh, and uh, uh, well, I'll go into a few things, but I know that, A.L., you have to uh, leave soon, but I, I'm glad that you've uh, rushed back from Sacramento to uh, be with us. And if you would just say a few words of welcome, because we appreciate very much uh, uh, your support for this uh, uh, event. So thank you very much. A.L. Noor. Good evening. Um, the war in Yugoslavia started in 1991. First, Slovenia, followed by the bloody conflict between Serbia and Croatia, and in 1992, the war in Bosnia began. This exhibition, the 6th floor, tells us how a tiny Jewish community with around 1,000 members helped save a multi-ethnic city of Sarajevo by working with all the neighbors of every religion. For the first time during a modern European war, Jews in danger had a place to go to. They had a state of their own, the state of Israel. Although most people don't know, Jewish organizations uh, like the Jewish Agency and the Joint Distribution Committee set up offices in Belgrade, Zagreb, and Sarajevo so that the Jewish families could be quickly processed and brought to Israel. There, they were, they were welcomed. Schools welcomed their children. Language lessons were provided for everybody, as well as housing. But were they all Jews? If you believe so, I recommend you take another walk uh, around the exhibition upstairs. All of these refugees waited for the war to end uh, so they can go home. But it went, for, went on for years. Many of those Yugoslavs became ex-Yugoslavs and have enriched the Israeli society ever since. The story that means the most to us, I think, uh, is the story of uh, Zeineba Hardaga. And her story is, one of the, is on, on one of the panels up there. In 1985, Zeineba became the first Muslim to receive Righteous Gentile Award. She saved a Jewish neighbor during the Second World War. 
Israel's Museum of the Holocaust, Yad Vashem, has given out thousands of such awards to those brave non-Jews who risked their lives, their own lives, to save a friend, a neighbor, or a complete stranger. But this story has a twist, because seven years after the hero was recognized, it was she who needed saving. And Zainaba, her daughter, and her son-in-law and granddaughter were all brought to Israel. She was then invited to Prime Minister Robin's office, the late Prime Minister Robin. She was, as you can imagine, overwhelmed. My friend Ed, oops, my friend Ed tells me uh, that the event took place on a Friday afternoon in Jerusalem in May 1994. Zeneva had been in Israel since February that year, and you can say that those two months uh, left quite an impression on her because after the ceremony, she turned to the reporters and told them to go home and prepare for Shabbos. Uh, she was a Muslim Bosniak, by the way. Uh, this exhibition uh, is mostly about how Jews and their neighbors and friends in Sarajevo, who were Serbian Orthodox, Catholic Croats, and Bosniak Muslims, all worked together to help save their city. As a representative of the State of Israel, and as somebody who served in the Balkans until recently, um, and tried to make friends with all different people there, and try to have them be friends with each other, I'm proud to say that in the quietest way, Israel played its part. It gave those who needed help what they needed most, a place of refuge. Thank you. The, I, normally, I, I, I'm certainly not a, a war photographer. Uh, I made my name photographing Jewish life in Central and Eastern Europe. And to be honest, uh, uh, chubby little rabbis uh, who uh, sat in their chairs and, and served you rugula and tea uh, were my kind of people to photograph. It was easier. Um, and you ate better. Um, the, um, uh, but in, in, in 93, I was in, somebody had, uh, uh, from a museum, and I won't say which, thought that the Serbs were going to come back to Dubrovnik, which had been uh, uh, surrounded and attacked in 1992. They thought they were going to come back and attack the city, and they were going to uh, destroy the synagogue, which I thought was the stupidest thing I ever heard, except they offered me uh, a job to go there and document the synagogue in Dubrovnik, which I did. Uh, and when I was leaving Dubrovnik, I was changing planes in Zagreb, and I saw someone from the Jewish community of Sarajevo, one of the leaders of the community, who looked at me like a, a favorite student who had gone wrong. Uh, and he said, you know, you came to visit us quite a few times in the 1980s when things were good. And I hope you made a lot of money from your first book. And uh, he said, but we really need you now. Uh, and I said, well, I, have a, I couldn't possibly come to Sarajevo. I, I have a terrible allergy. He said, what kind of allergy could you have? I said, I'm allergic to bullets. Uh, and he said, oh, we have aspirin for that. And I was so charmed by that answer uh, that I decided to get on a UN transport and flew in with him. And what I saw in Sarajevo was simply really unbelievable, or not be unbelievable for anyone who's from Sarajevo. Uh, and what we had is uh, an, an old synagogue from 1903, 1908, when it was built, the Ashkenazi synagogue of the city, built by the Austrians to make it look like a Sephardic synagogue so that it shouldn't insult the majority of the Jews there back at the time. and. Uh, and who was working uh, for the Jewish community inside? It was uh, Mus uh, we, we now use the term Bosniak instead of Muslim, Bosniak Muslims, 
Catholic Croats and Serbs and Jews. And I remember I sent Peter Schneider, who was a very big a German journalist over uh, 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 from the Holiday Inn where all the reporters were staying. I said, you got to go and take a look at that place. Um, and he came back and I said, what do you think? And he said, it's so noisy there. <laughs> Everybody's yelling, <laughs> and they're so voluble about everything. Um, and what, what we had here is, it, it was, the war itself could not have been worse. The city was besieged in, in May of 1992. Now, if you went home tonight, and you went to get a, to, to turn on the, a tap of water, uh, and nothing came out, you went to flush the toilet, didn't work. You want to turn on the heat or the air conditioning. The electricity was out. And know that it wouldn't come back on for the next three years. And it gets a lot colder uh, and a lot hotter uh, in Sarajevo than it does here. An entire society had been surrounded and was being starved. Uh, from the outside, the West sent in food packages from time to time, um, but by and large, twiddled their thumbs, agonized over what they should possibly do, and we see this kind of thing happening today in other parts of the world. Um, and this was in the heart of Europe. Uh, and uh, 11,000 uh, Sarajevans were either shot down or blown up. Tens of thousands were wounded. Bosnian Serbs surrounded the city uh, and lobbed grenades up to 1,600 a day into the city or more. And from Belgrade, coming from Serbia, men would come for the weekend with their hunting rifles and sit above on, on Vratza and, and other parts of the hills and for sport, shoot down people. This is how it was. Uh, and um, I've, uh, the, 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 the trauma of families who went through this um, uh, still have to deal with it. Uh, as you probably know that uh, uh, during a war, uh, during a siege, during a war, very few people actually commit suicide uh, because you're so worried about existing that you don't think in those terms. It's afterwards uh, that, that the emotion sweeps over you. Uh, the people of Sarajevo uh, who refused to leave uh, the city, and met, look, many didn't refuse to leave out of m moral uh, standing because nobody wanted them. They couldn't get out from, for most of them, but they didn't. Uh, uh, Sina uh, Beserevich is one of those people who's not Jewish, uh, who uh, came from Sarajevo. She's now on the staff of Berkeley. Uh, and uh, I've asked Zina to share some of her stories as a 13-year-old girl growing up in Sarajevo, and she'll say a few words to paint in a couple of the pictures for us. Zina? So... I want to say, um, I just want to start with something that just kind of, this is totally unpremeditated, but um, I just want to mention something that happened just um, 10, 15 minutes ago. Um, so while we were all upstairs mingling, um, this gentleman comes up to me and my friend, we were standing there and talking, and this, this elderly gentleman comes up to us and he says, is there anybody here who speaks Bosnian? So I go, well, I do. So he introduce, introduces himself, and immediately we kind of we get into a conversation. And in the first three minutes of the conversation, he, um, so he tells me that he's 85 years old. And in the first three minutes of the conversation, he really basically, um, in, in, in s such a poignant way, sums up um, how, um, how ironic and, and, and ridiculous that whole conflict was. He says, you know, I'm 85 years old, and um, I was with the battalion, back in 1945, in the Second World War, I was with the battalion that came into Sarajevo and freed the city. 
And I was, my commander was Pero Kosoric, and I think, for me, as a child, as a Sarajevan child, I think, oh, well, that's the name of, used to be the name of one of the main um, squares in, in, in the city. And he says, you know, back then, we were, it was all about brotherhood and unity, and all of us, Serbs and Croats and Muslims, we were all together, and we were, we were together, we were fighting the foreign enemy. And because we were together, we repelled this foreign enemy. And then, a few decades down the line, I lived to see a complete reversal of the situation where we turn on each other and the outside forces try to intervene to keep us together, but we repel them because of that. So um, I thought that that was such a, um, it, was, it was really such a, such a good way to sum up the sort of, the, 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 the paradox of the conflict, but then we both kind of agreed on, on one fact that, that during that time, Sarajevo was, um, it was a little world unto itself. Um, and, and there was no, I mean, it was, there was like, there was an immediate agreement between an 85 year old and a, and, and a 30 year old that yes, you know, there in Sarajevo, we all stuck together, didn't we? It was, there was no difference. There was no, it, it was not really, it was irrelevant what your name is and what your background is. We all suffered the same and we also all tried to help each other in the same way. And I think for me as, as, a, as a child growing up in that situation and, and it's no exaggeration, anything that, that, sort of that Ed was trying to sketch for you briefly just now um, about the conditions of life and how horrendous it was, um, I think for me that experience kind of, it, it is, of course it is horrible to, it is undescribably horrible to grow up under a threat and under bonds and under, and you know, really living as a hostage for three and a half years of your life um, and being hungry and being cold and being, being just stripped of any kind of notion of, of, of future and dreams and sort of as a child being just limited in what you can dream about. Um, but that sort of that spirit of Sarajevo, that spirit of togetherness, that kind of that community that, that we've built and that we stuck to and that we um, really stubbornly stuck with and um, did not want to renounce, that was the kind of, that was the shred of decency and the shred of humanity that pulled us through all of that. I think that is the reason why we survived what we've survived. Because if you think about it in terms of what it was for all that time, um, it's hard to imagine that anybody can survive it and, and, and remain sane. So I think it's that kind of, that, that, that spirit of, of togetherness and sort of just joint humanity. Um, it's something that not only kept us alive and strong, but I think it has made a whole generation of young people like myself um, really into, um, into the sort of individuals that I now, when I think about my generation, about my friends spread throughout the world, um, into um, extraordinary people in terms of the, 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 the passion and the drive and the compulsion that we have to make a difference in the world. Not to make a difference just in Sarajevo, to go back there and to make a difference there, yes, sure, but to make a difference in the world and to also stand as an example of how you can get through that and how you can make a difference. So in my work, I, I, I work here, um, um, I, I teach at UC Berkeley, and, and my whole sort of, when I, when I talk on this topic, I usually have, um, I usually have like a, a repertoire and I say, well, you know, this is really about, this is about my past because it's what I've been through. This is about my present because it's about the work that I do and this is about the future because it defines the sort of changes that I want to make in, in my life, in, in, in this world in as much as I can. Um, and, I, and I have been in it, um, I have, I've, have worked in the field of human rights my um, whole life and, um, <clears throat> and I intend to stay there not because, not because it's a, um, a deliberate career choice, it's really, it, it, it's a labor of love and compulsion. Um, and when I, when I talk about these things, I, I often think, okay, well, I can take several different perspectives. I can talk from a professional experience because I've done all this work with all these international organizations and I can talk about development and post-war development and problems and whatnot. I can talk from an academic perspective because I've studied it so much. Um, 
I can talk from a personal perspective, ah, and that's when everybody's attention sparks up because that is the story that people usually want to hear. What is it like? What was it like to be a child in that situation? Um, and how does a child in that situation become this kind of an adult who can really stand on her own two feet? Um, because believe me, the experiences that people have been through um, you would think that it would be difficult to do even that much. Just stand on your feet for the rest of your life. So um, what I thought I um, would share with you is um, when I was, so when the war started, I was, I was a kid, much like um, if you remember your invitation, the picture on your invitation of that little boy who was looking out of the window and, and crying. It's a picture of a boy who's um, parents have decided to send him away. <clears throat> a lot of kids ended up in that kind of a predicament, and, and this is such a fam familiar picture of these buses, busloads of kids being sent away from the city. And now, as, as a parent myself, I, I, it's just, I, I, I can appreciate how devastating that is. Um, but a lot of the kids remained. Um, and have gone through that experience. And myself, like, like a lot of other kids, um, we wrote journals every day. And I remember it's, um, I mean, it's, it's totally coincidental, but it's also very ironic. Um, just before the war started, one of the last books that, I, that, that, we, had, that we read at school as, like, as, as assigned books to read for homework was The Diary of Anne Frank. Um, and it was, I, it was totally, I mean, it was, you couldn't have planned it better because um, shortly after that, um, the war started. And, and when I wrote my, when I started writing my journal as a 13-year-old, I remembered um, how Anne Frank used to write to this imaginary friend. Um, so I started writing my diary to her, and I would start my entries with Dear Anne. And I would kind of also respond to some of the things that she was talking about and try to kind of talk to her and tell her how, in some respects, you know, Anne, the situation for us is worse. And, and then I would kind of elaborate why I think we're having it worse than Anne Frank. Um, so I, because I still kept all my journals, um, when, um, when we talked about this event, I thought, well, maybe it would be one thing that would be interesting if I, it would be if I found a little snippet out of my journal um, and shared it with you. So I found something, and well, obviously, um, given the time, uh, it was written in Bosnian, but I've tried to translate it as kind of literally and true to the spirit as I could. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it out. And okay, so this is, this is dated January 13th, 1993, and it says. Dear Anne, I was thinking about what you said, how boring it is to be locked up in hiding, to not be able to go outside. There's only so much you can do, and it isn't much. Now when the days are so short in the winter, it gets dark at four in the afternoon, and it's lights out for any reading or writing. I try to sit by the window to catch the last drops of dusk light, but then my mother starts shouting, are you out of your mind? Get away from that window before a bullet gets you. You know they can see us. I wonder who they are and why it bothers them that I'm sitting in the window and reading. Dad says, says it bothers them because they're not the reading sort. He says they are, that they are a bunch of thugs sitting up there in the hills, getting drunk and firing out bombs just to meet the daily requirements for carnage. There are also no more candles. The Catholic Church is not giving them out anymore. They say they've handed out all they had. They have none left. I think they're lying. Maybe you need to be a crot to get some. It would be nice to have some light because in the dark I really get bored. Then I think about all the other stuff, like how cold it is. Then mom starts to lead her exercise time, jumping up and down and all that. We all feel stupid. You're right, Anne. The worst thing is the nights are so long. 
we got a Red Cross message from my aunt. She says she sent a package through Benevolencia. It's La Benevolencia, but I'm saying Benevolencia. So that's the, that's the, that's the Jewish organization that we're talking about here. Um, <clears throat> Mom's been going around there checking the lists every day, but there's nothing yet. They don't open the packages. The Jews don't, like the others. So everything that is put in the package, you get seven exclamation marks. If my aunt has any sense, there'll be some chocolate in there. Well, I can't write anymore. It's too dark. There's nothing important happening anyways. I kind of, when I read this, I, I, really, I really paused over and I thought, there's nothing important happening. This is a teenage perspective. Couldn't get over the road today to see Jada. That was my best friend. I don't know anything about her boyfriend situation, but I'll keep you posted on that. And that's, that's the entry for that day. And um, it kind of, just as a footnote to the, to the La Benevolencia thing, um, so the organization was, and, and the reason why I was so excited was that it was true, like all the packages that we would get, that somebody on the outside sends you the food packages um, that would get through various aid organizations would be at some point somewhere stopped um, and, and ravaged. And anything that is, anything excitement inducing um, would be taken out. This was, this was another way of kind of a psychological torture that was being placed on us. Um, so you would get this package and you would be over the moon, that, ah, there's going to be stuff in there, and then there'd be the same kind of stuff that you get in humanitarian aid. The only packages that never got stopped somehow, miraculously, were the ones that came through La Bane Valencia because the Jews had a special arrangement with the guys who were at the at the stopping points, somehow. I don't know how, but we loved it. So people would, on, it was a daily routine to go and check the lists that La Bene Valencia would put out um, every day uh, what packages they received. And you would go there like, a, like, a, like an, a, an excited, I don't know, graduate student looking for your name to see if you've passed. And then when you see that you've got the package, it is the most exciting, the most exciting news because you knew there was going to be stuff in there. And it was more, it wasn't really so much for the food um, as it was for the, that sort of, that touch, that connection back with the civilization, with that kind of, you know, um, a, a, a little sense of human dignity being returned to you. So I think um, really when, when I think about it and why, when I talk about it, and this is, this is something that um, I, I think most of us who have survived Sarajevo, <clears throat> um, and younger people especially, um, something that we have in common, often we, when we talk about that time, um, we talk about it um, in terms of the best moments we've had in our lives. And it sounds really strange to say that in, that, in, a, in a horrible predicament like that. But I think that um, the experiences you have that are, that are so much about people helping each other survive um, on such a basic level, those experiences so much transcend anything sort of, any other normal kind of daily joys that they become larger and larger, and for the rest of the, your life, they become kind of markers of, of um, I don't know, I guess a, um, a sense of a, like a, a, a pinnacle that you've reached in feeling like a good human being, if that makes sense. Um, but I think that's all for me for, for now. <laughs> Thank you. Before we screen the, the film, I'll, I'll say something, Zena, and those are very poignant words. Um, you remind me of, uh, there's a, a Nobel Prize was written in, uh, was won in 1961 by Ivo Andrish, 
uh, A-N-D-R-I-C, and all of his novels are uh, here in this library. Um, Ivo Andrus, in his, his most famous novel, is called Bridge on the Drina. Um, uh, um, the, uh, no, my favorite novel was the other one, which was called, has different titles. One title is uh, Day, uh, Days of the Consul, and the other is Bosnian Chronicle. In, it's the story of the uh, French consul in Travnik. Sarajevo was not the capital of, uh, uh, of the, the, the administration center for the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Travnik was. Uh, and uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the novel, it takes place during the Napoleonic uh, period. And at the end of it, uh, the uh, French consul, um, uh, uh, Napoleon has fallen, and the consul's name was Daville, uh, has to go back to France, and he has absolutely no funds to get him there. And, he, um, uh, and he's worried about how he's possibly going to get out of Travnik and all the way back to France. And into his courtyard uh, steps a man by the name of Solomon Atias, uh, a Sephardic Jew, the oldest member of the Atias family. In, uh, uh, in, in Travnik, and he offers to write a letter of credit and to, and, and to loan Daville the, the funds to get home. And Daville looks at him and, and, and says to him, first of all, this is nobody else has offered to help me at all, but what I'm most curious about, Mr. Atias, is the, the, uh, the Ottoman, uh, 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 the vizier, had just been bragging to me at dinner how he had stolen all the money from the Jews, and he had taken all of your money. Uh, so I don't know where you are even getting any money to help me. And Atias uh, looks at him, and you have to understand that this was written, that he wrote his trilogy, his Bosnian trilogy, in, in between 1942 and 1944. And he wrote this in 1942, exactly when the Jew, and he was living in Belgrade in his apartment, exactly at the time when the Jews of Belgrade were being rounded up and murdered. In ga all the women in gas vans and their children, uh, and the men taken out and shot. Uh, and he goes into a three or four page monologue by Solomon Atias. And Atias begins his monologue by saying, to Deville, uh, it's true that the vizier had come to us and he had uh, 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 taken quite a bit of money from us. He said, but viziers come and viziers go. But we Jews remain. We remember everything that has been done to us in our hundreds of years from our expulsion from our beloved homeland, Spain. And we record all of these things which is why our cash boxes always have two bottoms. There's one for the vizier to scoop in and take what he needs, but there's always one, but there's always something below that for our families and ourselves and for our friends when they are in need. I read that book in the Holiday Inn, in Sarajevo, during the siege, and I couldn't believe the words that I had read, because they, they, they mirror what you had said. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll take a look at this film that's based on the exhibition. Uh, you, you don't get the Downton Abbey voice, you get mine. Um, uh, and we'll take a look at this, it's short, and then we'll, uh, we'll have a, a little bit of a discussion. Uh, of course, being the kind of audience you are, you probably won't have any questions. You'll just want to correct me. For hundreds of years in the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo, Catholic Croats, Serbian Orthodox, Muslims, and Jews all lived together. But as Yugoslavia disintegrated in the 1990s, many Serbian, Croatian, and some Bosnian political leaders said, we cannot live together. Many people believed that, and war came. But not everyone in Bosnia got that message. Here is one story.
between 1992 and 1995. For three years during the siege, Sarajevo was cut off from the world. Its great buildings went up in flames. More than 12,000 people were killed by mortars and snipers. Walls were built to hide people from the snipers. Signs were even put up to warn the population, but it didn't always help. The Bosnian Serb military forces cut off the water to the city, so this park in the center of town is where people came to do their wash, fill plastic jugs to bring water home to drink, to bathe in, to flush the toilet. And this is how they got it home. An entire society was reduced to scrounging, avoiding snipers, selling whatever they had or hoped to sell and then coming home to burn a few books or a chair to keep warm and cook on a wood stove set up in the middle of the living room. A great multi-ethnic city in Europe was dying. The Americans and the Europeans sent in food from time to time and watched from the sidelines as Sarajevo was bombed. People were losing hope, holding on. Even though most Serbs and Croats had left Sarajevo, some chose not to listen to their political leaders and felt that different people could live together. So some Serbs and Jews, and Muslims and Croats, continued to live together in this war-torn city of Sarajevo. And they were buried together too. On the night the shelling started in May 1992, people from the neighborhood around the synagogue sought shelter in it. That's when the community leaders like Ivica Cherezhnez, an architect, and Jakob Finci, a lawyer, offered them shelter for the night and food the next day. Soon others heard about what was going on in the synagogue and about La Benevolencia, the community's humanitarian aid agency. Not only did people come looking for help, they came looking to help. So let's meet some of them. The medical team. This is Surgeon, who became the chief doctor for La Benevolencia. He worked with Yadranka, another doctor, and Yasna was the nurse. Mirjana was the pharmacist, and for security, there was Adnan. And although he never had trouble with anyone, Adnan called on Sheriff, whose job was actually cutting wood for the kitchen. In the kitchen, Tsitsko was the cook, and Mara helped him serve. And Novo brought in the food from the warehouse, while in the office, Slobodan ran the computers for the community and Atso was the secretary. Vera was the treasurer, and Sonia was the head of the women's club, a Bohoreta. For communication, Vlado worked the two-way radio, while Timur kept the logbook in the radio room. And Dan helped deliver the post. Which of these people were Jewish? Catholic Croats? Serbian Orthodox? Muslim? At La Benevolencia, no one asked. No one cared. Here's how La Benevolencia operated during the war. Surgeon tended patients in the community center and he made house calls to people like Donka Nikolic, well into her 90s, who needed an injection every week just to keep breathing. During the war, like the water, the post was also cut off. So the Jewish community brought in the letters for the city and journalists were asked to bring in the post and come to the synagogue where letters were filed. Then people were phoned and heard those wonderful words. You've got mail. 
Since telephone lines were cut, La Benevolencia even set up a two-way radio system to the outside world, and families from all over Sarajevo came over to use it and to send messages to loved ones abroad. With help from the outside world, mostly from the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, La Benevolencia set up three pharmacies, and everything in it was free. Even a dentist came into the community center every week. As did children from the neighborhood who came in for puppet shows and celebrations to get their minds of what they could not have, and so La Benevolencia could show them that someone cared. Many older Sarajevans sent their children and grandchildren abroad and remained alone. So the Jewish woman's group, La Bohoreta, kept its members busy by creating treats for the children and spending their time together. During the siege of Sarajevo, La Benevolencia, working with JDC, arranged rescue convoys out of the city. The largest was in February 1994. To make it happen, JDC sent in logistics experts to meet with the Bosnian Prime Minister, with the Bosnian Serbs, and then with the UN garrison. When permissions arrived, lists were made, the buses arrived, and those approved made their way to the Jewish community center. The old boarded the buses, the young, and they prepared to leave the city where they were born in, a city that they loved very much. The UN escorted the convoy out of the besieged city. They raced across no man's land and entered into Bosnian Serb territory. That's where the UN remained and the convoy, filled with 294 Sarajevans from every ethnic group, made its way around the war zone and down to the coast of Croatia, its final destination. A journey that normally would take from Sarajevo to the coast of four hours took them over 20. Of those who left on that convoy, here are two stories. You are looking at Zainab Hardiga, the first Muslim to receive a Righteous Gentile Award for saving a Jewish neighbor during the Holocaust. Her daughter Sarah and granddaughter Stella cared for her, as did Surgeon the Serbian doctor who worked for the Jewish community and cared for his Muslim friends. Zainaba and her family were invited to come to Israel and they left on that convoy in 1994. You didn't abandon the Jews, Milton Wolf, the JDC president, told her. We're not going to abandon you. And when she arrived in Israel, even Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin welcomed her. Dennis Karolich, also a Muslim, was 13 years old in 1994. Dennis helped bring the water into the Jewish community every day. And he and his father, Harris, lived with Nada Levy. And Dennis's father was also helping out in the Jewish community. Dennis was best friends with Rasho, Nada's grandson, and the two would study their school books even when they couldn't go to school. In January 1994, Dennis was slightly wounded in a mortar attack. Surgeon picked the glass out of his shoulders and his back, and Dennis's father told him, you're going to go to Israel, even though I can't, so you can be safe. It's not easy leaving your home. It's not easy for a father to say goodbye to his son. But Rasho and Dennis rode through the night and the next day, for the very first time in 22 months, Dennis was in a place where no one was shooting at him. 
In the years ahead, Dennis would live in Israel and finish school there. And then he moved to Vienna, where he spent a decade at the Holocaust Restitution Agency, the National Fund. When asked why a Muslim from Bosnia would work there, Dennis said, I remember when I was growing up in Sarajevo, everyone I knew liked working together. And that was what La Benevolencia was all about. So by my working here today, perhaps I can pay just a little bit of that back. What makes it so interesting is that we're now 20 years out uh, from, from this story. And what makes it so compelling is that the it's being used, of course, we, we, we now, uh, because of social media and, and, and the way things are, this is a story that has even more re a resonance now in schools everywhere than we had 20 years ago during the war. Um, what makes it so fascinating is that um, the, 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 uh, the oh, I, I, I neglected to say that the film also has Polish subtitles. And, we, uh, and Hungarian subtitles. And we're asked now to make the film in, po to not just have subtitles, but to, uh, to, to, to put the film into a narration in Polish. We're using it in Israel and through the US Embassy in, uh, uh, in, in Tel Aviv, we're going to have Arabic narration uh, for uh, Israeli Arabs. It's a story that, uh, and, and uh, not perhaps not coincidentally, uh, I think we were all struck in this room uh, uh, at the death of Nelson Mandela and the outpouring of, of love and respect uh, and awe and admiration for this great man because we got to revisit all that uh, with him. Uh, and the fact that, you would, that he would actually turned around and reached out to his enemies and his jailers, uh, not only and forgave them, but asked them, to work alongside him. That's fairly remarkable. What we, there were plenty of people in Sarajevo, and let me be very clear about this, there were plenty of people in Sarajevo who thought that the idea of hating someone before, because of their religion was a pretty stupid idea. Didn't ha it wasn't only the Jews. Uh, it's just that this particular story resonates so greatly today in schools, in our public schools all over the United States. We specialize in our, our, our big uh, uh, schools are in South Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Alabama, uh, and Texas. Um, uh, and where most of the kids, by the way, in, in our schools, when we look at the, the data, eat free or reduced lunches. Uh, and yet they find in the story of Holocaust survivors who turned a synagogue into a non-sectarian aid agency where they worked with their friends and their neighbors, no matter what their religion, to, uh, uh, to work together and to really and to stand against hate. Uh, it was, uh, uh, there's no such thing I believe as, uh, I know I work in education now and, and have been for a while, I, I don't much care for the term genocide prevention. Uh, something that man has specialized in since a man has been there. But we must always fight the good fight. We must always look for ethical models. We must always look for those models that mean something to us morally. Uh, and this is what we had 20 years ago in Sarajevo uh, with, uh, uh, with, with the, the, this little Jewish community. I, I guess I would close by saying, you know that it, and for those of you who make bread, uh, you can have all the ingredients, but if you don't have that little tiny bit of salt uh, to put in it, it'll, it'll taste pretty flat. And I think that's uh, perhaps what the Jews brought to uh, their uh, 500 years in Bosnia. Uh, and I hope the, they will continue to do that uh, for a long time to come. I want to thank you very much for coming. Uh, and if you have any questions or would like to point anything out or make a statement or a comment, please feel free to do so. I'd be happy to hear from you. And, and just so you know, we are um, videotaping this. So when you ask your question and Ed calls on you, wait for me to come with the microphone. I actually have comments to make. Uh, you know, it started basically as uh, much of it was revenge uh, the Serbians had against the Croatians for the slaughter in World War II at the hands of the Ustashi. 
And at the break of the Yugoslavia, Serbians inherited the army. They were the majority, so they started that. Then Bill Clinton had his arms embargo that allowed the thing to grow out of hand. The Croatians, when they had weapons, they could fight back, and uh, that happened. And that's traceable to even to World War II, which was traceable to World War I. If Woodrow Wilson had kept us out of war, then Germany would have been totally defeated, giving rise to Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, and that's traceable to Lincoln keeping the Union together and all traceable U.S. Constitution. So I'd rather get to the virus that causes the trouble, that uh, uh, alliances that are uh, forged together by force of state it causes all the trouble. And these people are very heroic, but this is basically, it's just scratching the surface. Thank you. As, as H.L. Mencken uh, said uh, for every comment, uh, dear sir or madam, you may very well be right. Uh, <laughs> What, what do you think was the overriding reason that it, that it started? It, it, I didn't really get that so much from the, the film, and maybe that's too complicated, but um, I just wondered if you could address that, what you think kind of got things started. Well, in, in, in general, what, uh, when, I get, when I gave my speaking tours uh, about this issue back in the 1990s, um, uh, the Serbian American community, the Croatian and the Croatian American community always had people come to every one of my talks, and and of course everybody blamed everybody else, and so although I do have certain opinions on that, and I'll say just a couple of things, I generally tend tended to shy away from from that because everyone else was talking politics, and I wanted to concentrate on uh, as you said scratching the surface, sir. Um, one microcosm of how this one group of people simply refused uh, to hate their neighbors because of their religion. Um, the, the short point to make in regards to uh, Yugoslavia uh, and, 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 and the war, and the film doesn't address that because we use this, this film in schools everywhere, uh, and you're not going to be able to discuss the, the, the Balkan Wars, the Bosnian Wars, the Yugoslav Wars of the, and the disintegration of Yugoslavia uh, in an 11 minute film. Uh, the, um, basically, Yugoslavia was an artificial creation that came about after 1918. It was fairly unworkable when it first started. Uh, and uh, there were many of those in that artificial state that in 1941, when the Germans invaded, who were happy to see the end of it. Uh, that uh, civil war broke out among the, uh, among the, the players then. Uh, after 1944-45, Yugoslavia was reborn as a socialist republic under Tito. You could say that Tito was the last Habsburg in the sense that in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, no one had to be loyal to the empire itself, which was a ridiculously uh, a, a complex uh, multi-ethnic empire. You just had to be true Kaiser Troy, they would say, true to the Kaiser, the emperor. Um, and that lasted, as, and Tito was a, everybody's favorite dictator with, you know, with Lo, uh, Sophia Loren on one arm and Gina Lola Bridget on the other, on the deck of his yacht, uh, and his wife scowling in the background, uh, and his magnificent homes, everybody, he's everybody's favorite dictator, uh, and uh, big Cuban cigars. Um, uh, but Yugoslavia would not outlast him. Uh, and it did not. It took, it took only a few years uh, before uh, it collapsed. Nationalism works. Nationalism goes into play when you have to distribute losses. Yugoslavia are, uh, 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 economically was a disaster zone. Uh, uh, under Tito, he kept pushing things back uh, by giving more power to each of the uh, disparate republics. They developed their own economies, which were basically uh, competing with each other in places where they didn't, shouldn't have had them anyway. The point being is that Yugoslavia was held together with wild inflation, uh, or wild, excuse me, while there was wild inflation, the only hard currency earners in the state uh, were foreign tourists, and the remittances that families were working in Germany and Austria were sending back. And that was, uh, that was it. And they made some really, really bad cars. <laughs> and we'll all remember the Yugo. Uh, and uh, um, the, uh, uh, and what the country did, what Yugoslavia did not need was a brilliant strongman nationalist. Uh, 
which it got in Slobodan Milosevic. If you believe in the, 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 uh, 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 the, the great men of history theory, then many people would say that it was through, through him that this started. And what he needed was a, a thuggish nationalist who wasn't as smart as he on the other side, on the Croatian side. And that's what he got in Franjo Tudjman. Um, and this is only my own interpretation. Uh, um, and, 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 and therein lies the rub, and therein started the war. Um, the, uh, the Allies were perfectly, the Europeans were perfectly happy to let this continue, and they did. Uh, uh, it was, uh, in regards to the Americans who came in in 1995, never forget that it was Bob Dole who threatened to make Yugoslavia uh, a, uh, an election campaign an election issue uh, uh, for the uh, 1996 election, and it was because he was making that, that noise uh, that the Clinton administration finally decided to listen to the two biggest vocal supporters, which were Madeleine Albright and Richard Holbrook, and then acted. Uh, very, 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 very late, far too late, and the Dayton Accords were, uh, uh, did a good job of stopping the war and freezing everything in aspic, and it's been a mess ever since, and it's not a happy story now. Well, unfortunately, we have to end on that note, um, but, I, but I want to thank all you for coming. I want to thank Ed for such a wonderful program, wonderful exhibit. I want to thank Zena for her sharing her wonderful story.